Hello and welcome to Miniature Adventures, I'm Big Lee and this week I want to talk about storing your armies. So this week's talking point comes from a subscriber question uh, but it's also a revisit of a subject I discussed way back during the Covid lockdowns. Uh, Andrew Smith contacted me a few months ago, it has to be said, so sorry for taking something to answer this. And he asked, I first came across your channel looking at war game storage and ooh, filing cabinets. That's an idea. <laughs> so he seemed particularly excited by my storage options, so I thought it was a subject worth revisiting and asking if my confident assertion of organisational zen still holds true two years later. So I still hold true to the idea that good organisation is good for the mind. When I discussed this subject a couple of years ago, I was quite unequivocal that good organisation leads to better productivity. In particular, I've always found that having a good tidy up and getting well organised is a very cathartic exercise, very good for the soul. Uh, a cluttered workspace is inherently inefficient and adds an extra level of stress that frankly none of us can do within our lives. So for Wargamers, organisation usually means lots and lots of boxes, usually of infinite shape, dimension and materials, plastic boxes, old sweet tins, tool boxes, cardboard file boxes, large fruit crates, and of course the ubiquitous, really useful box. All have their pros and cons and have served Wargamers and their collections well for many, many years. Whatever your choice, its utility begins and ends with a well-organised workspace. Now I do like a tidy workbench. It speaks to me of order, structure and efficiency. Whatever doesn't need to be on your workbench probably needs to be stored elsewhere. So deciding what needs to be close to hand is the first step towards storing everything else. I believe that a well-organised work area should be the focal point of your gaming room, assuming you paint in the same room as your game. All my basic and most used tools and equipment are in direct line of sight and ready to hand, usually on my work surface somewhere. Slightly less used items are nearby in a drawer immediately below my work surface or next to me where I can find items quickly without them getting in the way of my most useful equipment. In its simplest expression, the further something it is from my work surface, the less often it is used or needed. Now one tip I always suggest is getting into the habit of having a clear desk, um, making sure that at the end of the day everything is put away and my work area is clean and tidy. Most painting projects won't be completed in a single sitting and if you're like me, you have several things on the go at the same time. However, I do always end uh, every painting session with a bit of a ritual. I put away any tools that I've used, sweep up off cuts and shavings, sand, etc. Throw waste in the bin. I put my paints back in their rack where they belong. And last but not least, I clean my brushes. This whole process just takes a couple of minutes, but it means that when I want to restart the next day, I have a clear work surface and can concentrate straight away on my miniatures. So with the organisation of my tools and equipment in hand, now let's look at the sort of longer term model storage that Andrew seemed so impressed with in his comment. I'd guess that most gamers store their models better than they do uh, their modelling materials and tools, and that's perfectly understandable. But I've also seen plenty of game rooms that look like a rather haphazard pile of cardboard boxes of random sizes. Yes, I'm looking at you, Ray. Personally, I'm not a fan of cardboard boxes because it has a propensity to attract moisture, particularly in relatively cold rooms or gaming sheds and that sort of thing. That being said, if your collection is in cardboard boxes, then I'd highly recommend buying some cheap silicon gel desiccant packs that you can get online, uh, you know, so you can put a few in each box. These can be bought really cheaply, and they usually put a couple in every drawer box, no matter what the material is. Regardless of what it's made from, I always put some uh, desiccant packs in there. Now, like many war gamers, I have a lot of really useful boxes. Uh, most hold the aforementioned modelling equipment, consumables of various kinds, and a significant part of my MDF mounting. Some of my rub boxes are assigned for the storage of terrain, although most of that is in a series of large plastic drawers in the corner of my room. However, I do also use some rub boxes for storage of armies, but that is usually a very temporary feature. So, for example, my Wars of the Roses Bosworth stuff is still in rub boxes a year after most of it was painted. That's partly because I'm 
uh, still using it more than other stuff at the moment, partly because I'm still tinkering with things like base labelling and so on, and partly because I want to transport these armies to the Shed of War at some point soon. However, this is still a temporary feature. I already have set aside some drawers in my cabinets for these models, and eventually the whole lot will be stored in a more permanent way in my metal cabinets. All of which, of course, leads to the Bisley Drawers units that Andrew was so excited about. So when I set up this room, I made a conscious decision to buy some metal storage units for my models. Now, I'd already acquired an old unit, which you can see here behind me, um, from a, an office clearance. And I'd been using it for a while, but it was starting to get full. It was more than starting to get full, it was full. And I needed a lot more space. So I bought three brand new storage units from Bisley to provide a strong, dry and more permanent home for my little metal men. And as I mentioned earlier, each drawer has a silicon packet in it. Now, several years later, even they are starting to get a bit full. Of course, buying these new was not cheap, but I had saved up for the purchase as a one-off cost in setting up my operations room. However, you can buy older units on eBay or Vinted or something like that, uh, for usually, sometimes for much less, but you have to be ready to travel to go and pick them up. Um, and it's also worth having a price in your mind, what you're prepared to pay, because these units can come in at all sorts of prices. So set your budget first. You know, the price can vary enormously. There are actually companies out there that clean and refurbish old units like this, but by the time they've stripped the paint off and cleaned them and then resell them, they're not far off buying brand new units. So yeah, whatever. The point is, is know what you're looking for, know what price you want to pay and uh, be patient you will eventually get them. Now our painting stations, desks and man caves can always get a bit messy at times. It happens to all of us at one time or another but trying to keep things tidy and organised not only helps efficiency it's also good as a way of clearing the decks mentally. And when we've finished painting and building uh, how we store our models for a long and active life on the games table is equally important. So, do you agree with me? How do you store your armies? Are you a cardboard file box kind of wargamer or a devotee of the rub box? Or like me, have you invested in a more robust solution such as metal cabinets or something similar? As always, I'd love to hear what you think in the comments below. It's time for a hobby update. Last weekend the wife and I went to Oxford for a few days and I finally got to visit Blenheim Palace. Uh, I wasn't sure what to expect but it's fair to say that if you've ever had a passing interest in military history then you'll find this a magnificent building and it will be absolutely fascinating. And if you already have an interest in the War of Spanish Succession then you really really need to visit this house. I defy any wargamer not to leave feeling inspired by what you've seen. Just don't expect to be inspired by the gift shop, but I'll come back to that in a moment. Now, briefly, the land and a substantial grant of money was given to the first Duke of Mulgra uh, in gratitude for his victory at the Battle of Blenheim in 1704. The Duke commissioned John Vanberg to build him a palace in the short-lived English Baroque style, and it was completed between 1705 and 1722. The result is a uniquely impressive building which has become a world UNESCO World Heritage Site. The inside is decorated in a style I can only describe as ultimate man cave, with nearly every room featuring stonework, tapestries, painted ceilings and flags dedicated to Marlborough's military victories. Uh, I shot a load of film and my video of Blenheim Palace was posted on Friday, so if you haven't already seen that, please check it out. I've also posted a load of additional pictures on my blog, because frankly I couldn't fit everything into the video, not without it being 30 minutes long. Now on the way into Blenheim Palace, I was saying to my wife how I was going to treat myself to a book or two on Blenheim or on Marlborough on the way out in the gift shop. But I was to be bitterly disappointed because the shop was singularly devoid of anything, anything related to the actual history of the building. I mean, that's not so stri strictly true. There was, there was a whole section of over 30 books about Winston Churchill who was grandson to the 7th Duke and who had the good fortune to be born here, albeit by accident. Uh, the palace had a, a special exhibition about Churchill, which you'd expect, but the whole of the rest of the building, from its architectural features, its ceilings and its series of huge tapestries, was dedicated to the 1st Duke of Marlborough and his victories. In the shop, aside from one overpriced guidebook, and all the usual overpriced tat that you get in these places, there wasn't a single book on the Duke of Marlborough or his military achievements. 
absolutely gobsmacked by this oversight on behalf of the shop. So workbench update, actually there's nothing really to say. I have a, a, all the travelling, sorting out pictures and just trying to recover from the amount of walking we did. I, you know, I haven't done any painting. Hopefully I'll get a little bit done over the weekend, um, but you know, I'm not promising anything. I'm in a, 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 a lot of pain from all the walking we did, um, but it was definitely, definitely worth it. However, I do have time for a book review. So uh, this time, I'm keeping with my uh, in keeping with my recent visit to Blenheim. I'm looking at Marlborough Goes to War: The Campaign and Battle of Blenheim, 1704, written by Ian Stamford and published by the Pike and Shot Society in 2001. Now, this is a 62-page booklet and is a really good primer for the origins of the War of Spanish Succession and, of course, the campaign leading up to the Battle of Blenheim. The opening chapter of the book sets the scene by explaining why the War of Spanish Succession came about and how the various parties involved drew up their alliances against each other. This also explains some of the intricacies of the political alliances and the complexity of achieving a sound strategy when part of a coalition. It's an interesting introduction to the period and while it is detailed, it is not exhaustively so. So just enough to give you a detailed outline of events leading up to the Battle of Blenheim and who was taking part and why. Obviously, if you want to know more about the War of Spanish Succession and the campaign, there are plenty of other books, but as a primer to kickstart you in this period, this chapter is pretty good. So having set the scene, the next chapter looks at the approach of the various forces and their deployment for the battle. There's a brief section on the Allied plan, followed by a very detailed order of battle, breaking down the participants in each section of the line. Understandably, the next chapter looks at the deployment and order of the Battle of Marshal Tallard's army, and again, a detailed order of battle. There's also a very clear black and white map, although as I've found with other periods, there can be lots of variation in different maps, so you know, find what suits you. If you want to wargame the battle, or part of it, you probably need to find a map that suits your scale and your, uh, what, the part of the battle that you want to play, or indeed the whole thing if you're going to do it in a very small scale. The rest of the book is a detailed step-by-step -step breakdown of what actually happened according to the sources that are available, discussing the key moments uh, of decision and outcomes. Stamford concludes with a section that looks at all the effects of the, the after effects of this battle. There are also some very interesting appendices at the back of the book listing the regiments that took part and various statistics that you may find useful. As with all the booklets from the Pike and Shot Society, it's very well researched and has a detailed bibliography and is a handy, compact guide to a particular moment in history. Although not written specifically for wargamers, it's hard to see how this couldn't be invaluable to anyone wanting to bring the period to their games table. So that's it for this week. If you enjoyed the video, please like, subscribe and share. And of course, if you want to keep up to date with weekly content from this channel, please tap the bell notification icon. So until next week, look after yourself, keep safe and of course, keep rolling high.